Father, have your way today. I just pray for Sabra, she interprets. Anoint her, Lord. As she would deliver the word. Just as much as I would deliver the word. But we want God, you to speak through us. The people don't need to know our opinions. The people need to know your heart. Come Holy Spirit. Speak to us we ask. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 So. Yes I need to carry on. That's a rubbish way to stop a sentence. So. I'm used to talking fast. But when I'm with an interpreter, I have to slow everything down. So for some of the English, it might be Aaron's talking slow today. Just slowing it down. So I have to get passionately slowly. Like something like this. Hallelujah! It's not do- Hallelujah! <laughs> I just wanted to see if my interpreter would copy. <laughs> she was like Dory off Nemo, wasn't she? <laughs> Have you seen Nemo? No. Yes. It's a joke against the Iranian then. One one. <laughs> in the Bible, David said, God, enlarge my heart. He didn't say, enlarge my head. What do I mean by that? In the world that we live today, this world with social media, this world with an internet that gives so much knowledge, you have so many people running after knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. And there's nothing wrong with knowledge. There's nothing wrong with knowledge. But David, who, who knew God, he didn't say, enlarge my knowledge. He said, enlarge my heart. And so I want to talk today about, do you know the God of the Word? Recently I've said a lot that people know the word of God. But do they know the God of the word? There's a difference. Do you know the God of the word? I see so much, so many arguments on social media. So many people sure they know the truth. And that their truth is the final truth. And this happens among Christians. And one side argues against the other side. And the other side says, no, we're right, you're wrong. And all they do is cause division. They don't cause God to look and say, great debate. It comes against the very heart of God. 
A God that loves his own church. And yet he sees the church arguing. And he says, I don't want that. But for whatever reason today, so many people argue amongst themselves about doctrine. So convinced they're close to God. And my concern for them is they know the word of God but they don't know the God of the word. We need to make sure we're people that not only know the word but we know the one that inspired the word. John 17 verse 3 It says, and this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We know things about God, but do we know God? I'm asking the question to everyone. We know things about God, but do we actually know God? He's not a distant God. He's Emmanuel, God with us. If God is with you, then surely you would know him. He's not a distant God. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. But to know God, there must be an intimacy. To know your husband or wife, there's an intimacy. You only get that intimacy in the secret place. You only get that intimacy when you spend time with God. When you do what the Bible says, shut the door and go to him, just you and him. But we're so busy. We run after careers. We want to make money and buy the, new, the newest clothes. We don't run after God. We run after the desires of our own hearts. And the Bible says that your heart is deceitful above all things. So we need to go to the secret place and say, God, I don't want to leave you until you've touched me. Because I don't want it to be my will, but I want it to be your will done. I don't want my desires always taking the first front, the front, the precedent. But I want yours to come through God. At the end of the day, God's a good God. He's not a, he's not a slave master. He's a God that created the heavens and the earth. And Jesus wants a relationship with every single person. His heart is that you may know the only true God. (laughs) 
There's a parable in Matthew 25. It's of the ten virgins. <coughs> five of them took it serious and five were careless. A parable is a story that Jesus would talk. So there's always a meaning behind it. And in this parable, it says that they went out to meet the bridegroom. You see, five had their lamps filled with oil. Five didn't have enough in. And so they said to the five that were full, can we borrow some of yours? And they said, no, no, no. You, you need to go and get it for yourself. Because this, this, is, this is mine for God. What, what happens if it runs out before we get to you? And, and in the same way, church, one day the bridegroom's coming back for his church. And within the church, there's going to be foolish people. And there's going to be wise people. The wise ones will, will stay in the presence of God. The wise ones will seek God. The wise ones will run after him and have a relationship with God. And the careless, foolish ones won't. They'd be like they're playing a game. Not really knowing the God of the Word. And this is what happened at the end of that parable, Matthew 25, verse 12. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. To the five careless, foolish virgins. The door to the feast was shut. The bridegroom had come. And they went, oh no, our lives haven't been great. We, we've only given so much. We need to go out and get some more oil quickly now. But it was too late. By the time they got back, the door was shut. Tomorrow's not promised any of us. Life is just a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Judas in the Bible. He walked with Jesus. Or it looked like he was walking with him. And then he betrays him. And you hear those words. Door shut, I don't know you. I don't know you. You might know the word of God, but do you know the God of the word? If you have a new relationship with God, 
then you should have a new relationship with sin. Or you don't know God. If you know Jesus, that life of sin before is no longer your life. You might know the word of God, but do you know the God of the word? Everybody makes mistakes. I, I, I get that. But when people live in a cycle of sin, and they don't feel bad about it, they refuse to repent, and they think they can cuddle the world and cuddle Jesus together, we would say, eat your, have your cake and eat it. They don't know Jesus. They don't know Jesus. Galatians 4 verse 9. But now, after you have known God, or rather known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? One Corinthians eight says. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by God. If you love God, you're known by God. In John 14, Jesus said, If you love me, follow my commands. If you're a thief in the room today, thief, robber, Jesus says, If you steal, steal no more. You can't say I love Jesus and be a bank robber as your job. It doesn't go together. Because when you give your life to Christ, the Bible says you become a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Yes, you're in transformation. It's not done overnight. It's not a message of condemnation. But it's a message to make sure that everybody in this room the cause and self a Christian when you stand before him you won't hear these words away from me I don't know you that the door won't be shut it's to make sure the Bible says like look at yourself have a look at your life and if it doesn't add up to what God is saying then turn away from me otherwise you're in danger of drifting so far the one day you hear those words away from me I don't know you my first job the, the role and the, the position that God has given me is to rescue people from drowning 
So I, I dragged them into the lifeboat. They're drowning in that sea. They're drowning in the sea of this world. And so I go and I give men Christ. I go and give men Christ, Jesus. Too often today, we give men other things. We give them a, a blessed new life. Or you can have freedom in that area. Or, or you can have this or you can have that. But the men of old would go and give them Christ. I'm not coming with a message that says accept this and be blessed. I'm coming with a message that says, receive Christ and be saved. And then when I've grabbed you onto the lifeboat, the journey of discipleship begins. If you love him, follow his commands. Don't live in a life of sin and turn a blind eye. Because there might become a hole in your lifeboat. It will start to take on water. And before you know it, you'll be like Galatians 4. <coughs> they had received Christ. And Paul says, how can you now go back to the things you used to do? How can you be caught in that bondage again? You're taking on water. If you love him, keep his commands. Love is not just keeping commands, by the way. That's just a fruit. And if you look at God's commands like wisdom and advice, it's not a dictatorship. If, if I've got a young child, I'm, I'm going to tell my young child, don't put your hand in the fire. Because if they do, they're going to burn themselves. And in the same way, God's put some, some boundaries out. He's put some rules. And he said, look, don't steal. <laughs> look, don't commit adultery. <laughs> look, don't murder. <laughs> don't do these things. <laughs> because if you do, <laughs> sin will run wild in this world. <laughs> and we see that today in our world. <laughs> But what we can't see is it in our church. Can't have it in the church. We've been called to be set apart. The people would see us. And know that God had touched our lives. And that he was real. And that he was true. And so people would turn to him and say, I want to know this Jesus. Because it's Jesus who saves. He saves. Dragged out of the waters and put into the lifeboat. 
ما رو از اون دریای گناهانی که داریم توش غرق میشیم میکشه بیرون و به کشته نجات میذاره Step 1 قدم اوله But step 2 اما قدم دوم Now be discipled. The journey of transformation. The journey of waking up every day looking more like Jesus than you did yesterday. Love is not just obeying commands. Love is passion. Do you have a passion for knowing God? Do you have a genuine passion to know Jesus? That's love. Yes, we we'll obey what God says. But there be a passion with inside. There'd be a desire to make him smile. There'd be a desire to be a sweet sound to his ears. There'd be a passion within you. If, if that passion has died within you, there's good news it can be set a fire again it's not a message of condemnation I'm happy for God to convict I'm happy for God to convict من خوشحالم که وقتی خداوند ما رو متقاعد و ملزم میکنه به اشتباهات ما. But we need to know the truth. ولی ما لازم هست حقیقت رو بدونیم. We need to hear things said as they are at times. ما لازم هست اون چیزی که واقعا گفته شده به همون شکل انجامش بدیم. Do you continue to grow in a hatred of sin? آیا شما میخواین همون جوری توی گناه و تنفر and continue to grow in a love for righteousness as someone that loves Jesus I don't want to sin I love righteousness that's the fruit of someone that knows the God of the word if you look at your own life today and you don't see that in your life I believe you need to say God touch me again open my eyes my, my heart's growing cold or the things of this world have started to take my eyesight don't, don't drift any further church don't let the enemy have his way the Bible says he comes only to steal, kill and destroy. If we put Mark chapter 8 up, Mark chapter 8. I preached on this last week in Albury. And I think it fits. We'll go very quickly through it. And we just take a verse at a time. Then he came to Bethsaida and brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. Notice they took a blind man to Jesus. No. Jesus was known as a rabbi then. They took a blind man to Jesus and they didn't say to Jesus, teach him, they said, touch him. 
عنوان یک معلم بگن اینو بهش یاد بده بهش گفتن اینو لمسش کن You see teaching informs us but touching transforms us You may know the word of God but do you know the God of the word? As we go on to verse 23. So we took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him he asked him if he saw anything. He took the blind man and led him out of town. You've got to be willing to let Jesus lead you wherever he wants to go. And look at that and when he spat on his eyes. Imagine if Saba wanted to spit on your eyes, Iranian church. How no? Like no. <laughs> you see, in this situation, I look at this, the way Jesus created this miracle. So many miss the miracle in our world today because we're picky about the method. We miss the miracle because we're too, ar- too busy arguing about our theology. One believes Jesus is coming tomorrow, another believes he's coming in a hundred years. One believes in pre-tribulation, one believes in post-tribulation. You argue. You, you let time pass by. Well, does division cre- is created? And the enemy rubs his hands. Look at that church arguing again. Satan means divider. But you see, God is unity. Is love. The enemy wants to split. And we help it so easy. Because we argue amongst ourselves. And in reality, we don't need more information. We need a touch from the king. Because one touch would change everything. Like whether it's pre or post. When you've been touched by God. You can say. I uh, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. When you've been touched by God, you can say, this is what I believe, but I can still walk with you, even though you believe different. You can say, You can say, iron sharpens iron. Let's sharpen each other as we find out. But when all you have is information and no touch. Then you just try and win battles all the time. 
You need a touch from Jesus. Verse 24. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Verse 25. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Jesus touched him one time. He said, what do you see? I see men walking like trees. He was obviously a man that used to be able to see. But had lost his vision. Otherwise he wouldn't have known what trees look like. Kind of simple. Very simple, but we miss it. Maybe there's some people in here that have lost their vision. I've got good news. One touch from Jesus. If it doesn't give you complete vision again or complete sight, he doesn't make mistakes. He's the God that finishes. He's the one that on the cross said to Telestai, it is finished. And so we touched him again. And his eyesight was restored and he saw clearly. There was a woman that bled. She bled for 12 years. And she said, if only I could touch the hem of his garment. I'd rip some verses down. But because of time, we won't go through them. But each one speaks about as Jesus touched. As he touched them, they were made well. As he touched them, they were delivered. As he touched them, they were set free. Maybe in here today, there's people that need a touch from a king. And church, we always need to be challenged in the messages. And we must challenge sin. It's not to turn a blind eye because I like that person. But it's your job to challenge the sin in your life. I won't stand before God for you. Sabah won't stand before God for you. You have to challenge the sinful behavior in your life. And said, if I love Jesus, this part of my life no longer belongs. It may be a struggle, it may be difficult, but you will actively be trying to get rid of it. It will be a sure fruit and a sure sign that you love Jesus. If you're happy to just walk with sin alongside you, I'm sorry, but you don't know Jesus. While we're in this house together today, let me give everybody an opportunity. 
I do this every week. It's nothing new. If there's anybody in this room today that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I just give you an opportunity to respond to the gospel. The gospel is this. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The Bible says that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Jesus is the one that gives life. He gives life, he puts life into the lungs of that little child. He put life into your lungs and your heart today if you'd allow him. But what he does is he takes away the sin that has been placed. He got up on the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. There were many witnesses to his resurrection. But ask yourself this. If Jesus isn't who he said he was, why did the disciples go through so much pain and death for a lie? It's not like they sat round a fire and said, let's make a lie up. And then Peter says, well, that means we're going to be butchered. And James says, yeah, that'd be a great idea. Let's go along with this lie. No, they went along with this truth because they knew it was true. They saw it with their eyes. And so they were martyred. People that have gone before us. Living for Jesus with everything they've got. For us that are Christians, we need to look at our lives and say, do I truly live for Jesus? And for those today that say, I want to know this Jesus that you talk about. While every head is bowed and every eye closed. If there's anyone in here at all that says, I don't know Jesus, but today I choose, I want to know him. Would you just raise your hand for me? We'll quickly look around the room. For anybody that doesn't know Jesus but says, Today I want to know him. Bless you, my brother.
<laughs> yes. Church, nothing wrong with your claps or anything like that, but let me just explain something. We're about to have a party in a moment. We're going to worship and then eat because of our brother. Because he he was on this path that led it, it led to death. And then like scales fell off his eyes. And he said, Jesus, I turn. I want to follow you. He just got pulled out of the water and placed into the lifeboat. We should be going absolutely crazy like, thank you, Jesus. Like, thank you, Jesus. And we, we shouldn't manufacture it, but we do need the worship team up now because once we've finished, we need to just go straight into worship. But we shouldn't manufacture something. It should just come naturally. He just received Christ. He was dead and now he's alive. Don't be British. Iranians never be British. Like dance, rejoice. When we worship now, if you want to dance, you dance. And if you need it.